you say and spell your name for us and what we should put for your title? Brandon Davis, B-R-A-N-D-O-N, D-A-B-I-S. I'm the Director of Oversight and Public Accountability for the City of Grand Rapids. To start off, I want you to take me back to 2019 when the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability was created. Were you involved in that process on the beginning? What do you think the goals were when it was founded and started? And then after that, how do you think that you've lined up with that two and a half, three years later? Sure, so yes, I was involved in the process uh, with the creation of the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability. Um, so the city of Grand Rapids, as, as you know, um, has been looking at public safety for some time. There's been lots of studies and reports that have helped to inform our city commission and our city manager on how we move forward in our public safety spaces. Uh, in particular, one of the recommendations that came out of one of those studies was um, the creation of an office like the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability. So when the city manager came to the city of Grand Rapids, uh, he was very interested in implementing that recommendation, in part because he'd seen the success of that type of department uh, when he worked in Austin and worked in other spaces. So he knew it was a priority. Um, and he asked me to work, at least uh, initially on an interim basis, to help to build the foundation for this office. So I began to do that at that point, uh, and we've moved forward, and I was officially hired uh, full-time in 2020 to uh, continue to work. We talk about those goals. I think the ultimate goal of the office is to build bridges to trust um, through increased accountability and transparency. But what I often say when describing that is you can't build uh, a bridge on a rocky foundation. So in order for us to even get to a place where we could talk about trust, we have to dig up that foundation which has eroded over the years. Trust is eroded um, and, and quite honestly, if we talk about the history of policing and things of that nature, we understand why. Um, so the goal is to get to that place where there can be trust, but I think that the, the, the steps to getting there are increased accountability and increased transparency. I think we've taken a lot of great steps in that direction, and I think there's a lot more room to go. How, when you talk about accountability, do you make sure that you're working proactively as opposed to reactively? With everything going on right now, it's very easy to say, we're going to look into this mm -hmm. for something that's already happened. Do you, how do you build that trust by acting before things go wrong? Uh, great question. So we look at uh, our work using the acronym CARE, right? So change, accountability, restorative justice, empowerment, and engagement. So when we think about those four spaces, each of them are important to the work that we do, but they operate differently. That first change space is really policy work. That's where we evaluate policy, we look at trends, we look at data to help inform what should be happening, and that's before incidents occur. Right? So we've worked uh, with the NAACP on the surveillance policy. We worked um, with the department, the, the police department, as well as the law department with some of the use of force policies. Those are the types of things we do proactively. When we talk about the accountability arm, at least in the way we describe our acronym, um, that A there, we're really looking at individual instances. Uh, those individual in instances most certainly are. Uh, reactionary, right? That's the nature of oversight work, is to look at what has occurred and then to make determinations about it. But we're proactive in our policy space. We're also proactive as it relates to restorative justice. We're working in community to bring programming that really looks at the, heart of the harm that's been done in the criminal justice system, but it allows us to help people to move forward, as well as with our engagement arm. And that engagement arm is about being in community, speaking with community, learning from community to apply that knowledge in our public safety spaces. So it would be irresponsible to say that your job is simply to provide a check to the police department, but. Exactly, that's just not what it is. Um, I think that's how a lot of people think about it. Uh, you know, because our office is involved in so many different spaces around public safety, some people see us as an engagement department, and some people see us as that accountability oversight department. It's rare for people to understand that there's all of those things combined. So that's the change, the accountability, restorative justice, and the empowerment and engagement. So you started in 2020 when a lot of what we saw back then is the same calls we're seeing now mm -hmm. in the past two weeks. We talk about reactionary to an incident that happened on May 4th with the killing of Patrick Leoya. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be a lot of people that say, 
it's the same thing that we've seen again with George Floyd, with Breonna Taylor, with Ahmaud Aubrey, with all of the names that one of the cries of the protests is we're tired of saying names. What changes have been implemented in Grand Rapids in the past two years that have led towards that change? So I think a lot of things have happened. So I, I want to first, before we talk about what we've done well, um, I think it's important that we acknowledge that, that no matter what we've done well, there's still someone who has lost their life and that's traumatic. And the, and the loss of life is never a good thing. It's not something that I, I quite honestly feel wrong talking about we've done all this good stuff when someone's life has been lost. So I want to acknowledge how that can sound and how that can feel for people who may be listening or, 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 or learning about our office in this way. So in no way do I intend for this to be disrespectful. Um, and my heart legit does go out to Patrick's family and to everyone that's been impacted by this tragedy. I grieve with our community. Um, but when I speak about the, the work that's been done, I do believe that we've been doing work. I mean, I think there's a lot more work to do, but we've been doing work. So we know that there's been uh, a police strategic plan has come out. There's also been a strategic plan for the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability. I can speak most to the work in OPA. Uh, one of the things we, we do is we uh, lead the city's part of the Cure Violence Program, which is the evidence-based violence reduction program that's been implemented throughout the city of Grand Rapids. We partner with the Urban League in doing that work. That is an imp important body of work that we're doing that looks at utilizing community members to help reduce violence. Uh, that's a different way of doing it, but it's evidence-based. And it's responsive to cries that we heard from community when, we at, when community asked for this type of program to be put in place. So I'm proud of the work that our office and the city are doing around that. We've also worked uh, with our restorative justice programming. That includes uh, us doing a Know Your Rights program. That program is designed to help community members learn their rights and responsibilities. You know, I often say, as a lawyer, I went to law school for three years to learn how to interpret the law. And I still have to look up the law to make sure that I understand it. And we expect community members to know everything about the law um, and they don't even have the benefit of that type of uh, understanding or that type of background. Uh, why is that important? Well, we do this work to try to make sure community members can understand the basics of those rights and responsibilities. Um, and, and at this point, we're working to even ramp that up even more. We've done some work with that program, but now we're working to ramp it up and make it expand it uh, across our community. So that's some of the work that we've done. We've worked on that surveillance policy with the NAACP, which really is over a year of work, where we sat down and we looked at the policy, we listened to community, understood concerns, and we worked to uh, make sure we improve the policy by providing the protections that are needed for community members, by elevating resident voice in those spaces. And we continue to do that type of work, not just as it relates to the surveillance policy, but all of the policy work. That includes a uh, use of force policies that were updated in 2020 and responds to demands from community, requests from community in those spaces. There's a lot of things that are being done across the organization. I think one of the things that are important is that the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability accepts complaints. That was not always the uh, the case. That's important because we know there are members of the community that just don't feel comfortable going to police to make complaints about actions of police. So now they have a civilian space where they can come and they can make those uh, complaints and we can help them through the complaint process. We've done evaluations of our public safety boards and commissions and released reports regarding that. We've done comprehensive analysis of past studies that have been released. We've been doing work. We've been doing good work, but that doesn't mean we've done all the work that needs to be done. There is still a lot of space for us to continue to grow. There's a lot of space for us to continue to improve, and that's not just in Grand Rapids, that's across the nation. We have to understand that as we work to fix systems that weren't designed uh, to be fixed, right, those systems take time. And I acknowledge that, but the truth is, we have to move at a very fast pace because the loss of life cannot happen because a system is broken. I wanna go back to one thing that you had mentioned of the taking complaints mm -hmm. of people not feeling comfortable going to the police. A, a lot of the cries we've heard over the past two, three years for change is that 
police shouldn't be tasked with everything. Mm -hmm. They're trained in law enforcement, not necessarily crisis management mm -hmm. for somebody in a mental health uh, situation, something like that. What, what has that allowed you and the Office of Public Oversight and Accountability, Office of Oversight and Public Accountability, excuse me. No problem, um, it's a mouthful. <laughs> what has that, for lack of a better word, a suggestion box allowed you to do? Have there been tangible things that have come out of the things you've heard from the community? Most certainly. So when we get complaints from community, it's generally about individual officers or about instances that have occurred. And what we're doing is helping the individual navigate that internal affairs process to make sure that their voice is being heard and make sure that there's procedural justice, right? We want our community members to understand that there is somebody working on the inside of the city that will help them navigate these tough spaces that can be, you know, emotional, that are sometimes filled with trauma. Um, so that's what we're there for. I think it's allowed us to connect with people and show them that there is care and concern in these spaces. The truth is, is that, you know, government doesn't feel warm and fuzzy. Um, and, and for a long time, people expected government to be procedure only, to be process only. That's not the expectation of our community today. Um, and that's not the expectation or the desire of our community leaders today. I want our community to know that I care. I want our community to know that I grieve with them. I want our community to know that I'm concerned about what they're concerned about. Now, the thing is, as a government, we do work through policy and procedure to get to solutions, and that can sometimes be difficult. But one of the things that the complaint process has allowed us to do is to be able to explain that in a better way, right? So community members can come and we can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations that go beyond the words on the website to help them understand that whereas I understand and I'm concerned, here's the policy we're working with and here's how it works. But what we do is we listen. And if we hear a policy concern, we say, we need to go back and address this policy because the policy doesn't allow us to move forward in this way, and we should, we should look at how we fix that. How important do you think it is, you talk about grieving with them. At the demonstrations and the protests, I've seen you and I've seen Robert Womack, mm -hmm. two black community leaders. Do you think that there's a responsibility for elected officials and for government officials to be out in the community with the people as they're grieving, as they're voicing their concerns and their thoughts? Sure. So I'll say I've seen other elected officials yeah. and appointed officials at events. Um, so I don't want to take credit for being in this space. I'm in those spaces because, as I indicated, I'm grieving with community, right? Um, and I think it's important that we have those times to process. I do think it's important for community to see the humanity of its elected leaders and see the humanity of our appointed leaders as well. I think it's also fair to point out that, you know, some spaces are just for community and they don't want elected leaders there and they don't want appointed leaders there. And I think we have to respect that as well, right? So there's a balancing act there. Um, in one space, we're handling an investigation um, and can't provide the answers that people in community want at this point. So being present isn't always helpful, right? So we try to, I try to walk that line of, you know, the concern that I have and the space of me wanting to have the ability to grieve with others that are, that are struggling through these processes as well, but also respect the space that as a government employee, sometimes I'm not the person that people want to see while they're grieving. So I think that's a tough line to walk, it's in, but it's important for us to understand and be able to dis, uh, differentiate the difference. And then I want to ask about the investigation mm -hmm. with the incident of the killing of Patrick Leoya. Mm -hmm. What responsibility does OPA have in that, especially now as MSP is actively investigating? What are you in the office doing at this moment, and what is the future of that investigation from the OPA side look like? Great question. So OPA monitors and audits the investigative processes of the city of Grand Rapids. So the difference here is that the Michigan State Police are, are conducting an independent investigation. OPA is not at the MSP you know, office 
looking um, over their shoulders as they conduct that investigation. However, once their reports are turned over to the city of Grand Rapids and they become a part of the investigation that the city of Grand Rapids would do in that internal space, OPA will look at those, we will audit those, we will monitor it. We will uh, work to ensure that we work towards truth and justice. That's, that's our goal in every investigation that we're involved in. We're seeking truth. We're not seeking to protect anyone. We're not seeking uh, to do anything to cause someone harm. We're seeking truth, that's our job. And we're seeking ways to be transparent about the truth that we find, that's what we will do. But we'll also evaluate a lot of the questions that have come up throughout this investigation, which include, you know, when should video be released? I heard the concern from community about the amount of time that you know, it took to release video. Uh, those are questions that we need to look at. Do we need to evaluate whether that should be explicitly in policy? Would that help in, um, you know, God forbid, for, you know, in, in situations that may occur? Those are the types of things we're looking at. When should a name of an employee be released? Those are the types of things that we, we will be looking at and evaluating. What are the proper ways to, um, you know, we need to look at our policy about the independent investigation. In this case, we did an independent investigation and the goal behind that policy was to make sure that there was transparency and to make sure that there was fairness, right? So there wouldn't be a conflict of interest. But we know in some ways that left community feeling like they didn't have answers. So we need to evaluate all of those processes. That's the work we will be doing and we will continue to do. We'll also evaluate all of the policies that come into play in this type of instance. We'll look at our use of force policies. We'll look at our policies around officer-involved shootings. We'll look at our policies around traffic stops. We have to evaluate those types of things, do the studies around those things to make sure that we're moving forward in a way that best serves Grand Rapidians. You talk about transparency and fairness, and in a sense it does seem like the right idea of we're having this outside entity look, that way there isn't that conflict of interest. Do you think it's fair or do you think that there's validity to the complaint that while it is an outside source in MSP, it's still a police investigation? It's still police investigating a police officer. Do you think that that allows for the most transparency? Is that another thing that you're looking into? Well, so whenever there's, an, we, we know in this case there's uh, likely going to be an evaluation for criminal charges. The way our system of government is structured when there is an evaluation for criminal charges, the police are involved in that investigation. So in this specific instance, um, in order for that to happen, there would be some type of police agency involved in that process. Uh, I don't mean to take away from the concern the community feels around that space. Uh, part of why my office exists is because there's been concern about police policing police. Um, and I think that is a legit concern. Those are things that um, make sense to raise. That doesn't mean that the investigation that's being done by MSP is wrong in any way. I'm not suggesting that. And I don't feel that it's inappropriate for MSP to be doing the investigation. But I do understand the concern that's raised by community regarding it. You know, I've worked in the criminal justice system for my whole career. Right? So I was a prosecutor for a big part of my career, involved in trying homicides in very serious cases. I also worked as a defense attorney throughout my career. I'm gonna have a different level of comfort with the way some of these processes work than community members who have not worked in these spaces. And I think that's fair for them to have the concern. I think they should have the concern. I think they should ask the questions. And I think as officials, it's our responsibility to respond to them, listen to them, and try to move forward in the best way possible. And then the last question that I want to ask you may seem simple, but I think that is, it's very important. It's, it's two parts. Why should Grand Rapids trust the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability, and the second part of that is why should they trust Brandon Davis as the man to lead it? I think that is a, a tough question because when we talk about trust, um, we know that trust between government and, and certain members of community, especially black and brown communities, has been eroded over years and years and years. I can tell you the reason I do this work, uh, the reason I do this work is to make a difference in community. I say that without any hesitation. So um, when I became a prosecutor, I, I grew up in a community um, on the west side of Detroit in a neighborhood so tough my mother didn't allow me to ride my bike one house to the right or one house to the left, no exaggeration, that's the truth. Um, and the people in the community that I grew up in, um, many of them didn't graduate from high school. 
Many of them were involved in gang activity. In fact, one of my brothers was involved in that type of activity and was shot, right? Um, I come from communities where I understand that things aren't always perfect. I work in a criminal justice system to try to make the change because I remember when I was pulled over by police at 16, pulled out of a car, thrown on the hood of the car, and roughed up. And I remember the fear that I had when that occurred. That's something that will remain for, with me forever. I remember when we were at church and my brother was across the street at the gas station and he came out of the gas station and was assaulted by police at the gas station because they thought he had taken something from the store when in fact it was somebody else. Those things will remain with me forever. I work in this space to do police accountability, not to say that, uh, not to cause harm to police, but I work in this space so that there can be real accountability and transparency. I can't make people trust me. I can't make people trust our office. And I understand the history of policing and the history of government that makes people question that trust. But what I can say with full assurity and full truth is I do this work because I've experienced it. As a black man in America, I know what it feels like to be afraid for your life when you're pulled over by the police. And I work because I don't want my children to have to continue to grow up with that feeling. I work because I want our communities to be safe. I work because I believe there needs to be truth and transparency. And I hope that helps community understand why I approach the work the way I do. Anything else you want to add? No, thank you. I appreciate your time.